Good evening all and uh, welcome uh, to this Wednesday evening webinar, uh, which uh, this evening uh, is dealing uh, with um, the challenges and opportunities uh, to surgical care in Northern Ireland. And uh, I'm delighted to say we have um, a very uh, uh, a comprehensive uh, group of presenters uh, who will uh, address uh, everything from the organizational structure uh, to the um, actual difficulties of uh, delivering service uh, to training. And um, on behalf of RCSI, I'm very grateful uh, to all for, for participating. Uh, our co-chairs for this evening are Thomas Lynch, who is chair of the uh, RCSI Northern Ireland Liaison Committee, and also Eamon Michael, who is a, a surgeon practicing in Northern Ireland and is a council member. Uh, the uh, rules for engagement, so to speak, are those that we have every Wednesday evening. Please, if you're not speaking, turn off your camera. Uh, please ensure that your microphone is turned off unless you're speaking, otherwise we tend to get feedback. And please do use the chat function uh, for uh, uh, any comments or questions that you wish to have uh, put to our panel members. So I'll hand over to Thomas and uh, to Eamon uh, to introduce our speakers and thank you all for joining us. President, thank you very much indeed and welcome to uh, all our speakers and uh, our audience here this evening. I won't waste any more time and what I'll do is I'll uh, introduce uh, Jennifer Welsh uh, who is going to be the first speaker and Jennifer will let you know exactly who she is and what she's going to talk about. Thank you very much Jennifer and you're most welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody's delighted to be with you this evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Jennifer Welsh. I'm the Chief Executive of the Northern Health and Social Care Trust and I'm here representing all of the Chief Executives of the delivery organisations in Northern Ireland this evening. Uh, next slide, Catherine, please. And the next, thank you. I thought it would be helpful actually to start um, with an overview of how the health and social care system in Northern Ireland actually works. And it is that, it's an integrated system of health and social care together. We have our Minister for Health at the political level. As you will all know, he's one of 10 ministers in the five party executive, which doesn't always agree. And that can be a challenge in terms of some of the decision making in a timely way. Our Department of Health sets the strategy and policy and the funding that they receive from the Northern Ireland block grant is over 6.5 billion pounds. So in fact, they receive almost half of all of the funding that comes into the, to the Northern Ireland Block Grant. The flow of money is to our commissioning organisation, the Health and Social Care Board, and the board then commissions with various groupings in terms of providing the levels of services across Northern Ireland. So from a trust perspective, there are five health and social care trusts organised on a geographical basis, and the final trust is the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. Uh, and while that is a hierarchical organisation, uh, the layers in between are actually very shallow and we all meet together regularly. Um, uh, Mark Taylor will be talking later on uh, probably a little bit about the Rebuilding Management Board. That is a grouping made up of senior officers from the Department of Health, Permanent Secretary, Deputy Secretary and Chief Professional Officers, along with the Chief, Chief Executives of the Board, the Agency and all of the Trusts, uh, both to consider the challenges of the pandemic but also to look ahead around rebuilding and recovery. Next slide please. So this depicts uh, the geographical boundaries of the various different trusts. So starting in the upper right quadrant is the Northern Health and Social Care Trust for which I'm responsible and moving clockwise, the Western Trust, Southern Trust, Southeastern Trust, uh, and then the Belfast Trust, uh, smaller in geography, but obviously a large population. The red dots that you see are described as type one hospitals. These are predominantly the larger hospitals with level one emergency departments and also where a lot of the major surgery is carried out. And it's probably fair to say that were we starting from scratch, this is probably not where we would build all of our hospitals. Uh, and certainly a challenge for us in terms of theatre resource uh, and also in terms of reform. Next slide, please. So how are we doing in relation to the services within Northern Ireland? And sadly, the, the point is not very well. Whenever we look at outpatients alone, the total number of people waiting for an outpatient appointment 
is now approaching 360,000 people. And a significant majority of those, over, over half, now waiting for longer than a year. And I'm sure it won't be a surprise to anybody whenever we look at the biggest volumes of waiters being in general surgery, ENT, and dermatology. Next slide, please. And whenever we consider inpatients and day cases, almost 120,000 patients waiting. And again, across general surgery, trauma and orthopedics, ENT, and so on. And it's probably worth saying that whenever we consider those two figures together for inpatients and day cases, and also for those outpatients, that constitutes a quarter of Northern Ireland's population on a waiting list for something. The next slide, please. So of course we know that the top 10 interventions that have the largest impact on sustained quality of life include many surgical and other interventions. And sadly, we have not been doing enough of those even before the pandemic. And the pandemic has had a significant impact on the level of activity that we are able to deliver. And that of course tracks through in relation to worse outcomes for patients, impact on mental health and wellbeing and increased urgent and emergency admissions, which we're certainly seeing along with the creation of a two-tier system and increasing health inequalities, these impacts are felt well beyond the health and social care sector itself. So that's the impact on service. What does it mean for training? Next slide, please. So I'm Aidan Armstrong, I'm consultant colorectal surgeon in Belfast, and I'm sure most people will be familiar with these four graphs. The JCST don't really release deanery by deanery um, uh, figures for e-logbooks. However, I think it's fair to say that it's likely that the Northern Ireland figures will be similar to the rest of the United Kingdom. And you can see that in April 2020, uh, when the first wave of COVID really bit in, that there was a huge drop in all scheduled activity in cardiac surgery, TNO, ENT, and general surgery. There was a commensurate drop also in trauma and orth in trauma um, surgery as people were locked down, not driving their cars. You can also see that we have not got back to our previous levels of activity. Next slide, please. Click it another couple of times, please. Yeah. Within um, the NHS, um, training is entirely dependent on service. If we don't have a functional service, we will not have any training. Training is embedded in the service. Trainees provide a substantial service commitment and without functioning service, we can't train in outpatients, ward rounds, interventional procedures, study, research, all the facets that are required to produce a surgeon. Click twice, please. These are some figures which I obtained this week from my own trust in Belfast. And you can see if we go back to 2018 and compared with what happened in the last year, there have been catastrophic drops in many of the interventional procedures carried out and with a commensurate effect on the availability, uh, availability of training opportunities. Even if we look at 2018 in the context of cardiac surgery, if we go back 10 years before that in 2009, 2010, this was a unit that was getting close to a thousand cases per year and we're now down to 141 last uh, in this calendar year. Next slide, please and click once more. Along with the training issues and the reductions in cases, there are huge deficits in nursing in Northern Ireland. Across the region, there is a deficit of around 9.1%. However, this is concentrated in a much more severe way in theatres, surgical wards and critical care, particularly in my own trust, where in some areas, the numbers uh, of uh, the percentage reduction is greater than 40 or 50 percent. It's worth noting that in the critical care areas around Northern Ireland, 91 percent of the place deficits are within the Belfast Trust. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that that is over three intensive care units in, in, on two sites, but still there is a huge and disproportionate problem within Belfast. Next slide, please. So again, click again, and you can see that there have been no sorry back on there have been historical failures of surgical plan. We now have staffing and primarily nursing staffing crisis, leading to the closure of theatres and surgical wards, service reduction, and then at the top of that, with all the other things failing, training fails. Next slide, please. 
So how did we get into this situation? And the answer is really about non-recurrent funding. Whenever we look back to 2005, the hospital waiting times in Northern Ireland were already the longest in the UK. And there were huge efforts made at that time to try to do something about it and to secure additional funding. And we did secure additional funding, but it was predominantly non-recurrent in nature. And that meant that we did not have the recurrency or indeed the capital to invest in our infrastructure, our theatre resource, or to invest in any permanent workforce enhancement. So we got this regular injection of non-recurrent money up to about 80 million pounds each year. And for a short time, the circles in green and the lines in green on the graph, we were able to meet the waiting time targets. But sadly, from about 2015 on, the non-recurrent funding has significantly reduced. And it's also been increasingly uncertain, often coming through late in the year, where we had predominantly relied before that on the use of the independent sector, or indeed our own staff doing additional waiting list initiatives we were unable to secure that. The pandemic then further reduced the capacity within health and social care itself and the demand for private treatment and that concern that I've had about a two-tier service has further reduced the availability of the independent sector capacity. Next slide please. So really we have got ourselves into a very vicious annual funding cycle where there is a recognised gap between the capacity and the demand that comes from our population. Our waiting times grow the additional recurrent funding is not there to increase the capacity. Non-recurrent funding comes in year. Uh, we try and purchase additional activity in-house or IS. The long waiting times is leading to increased urgent and emergency presentations at our EDs. Those pressures are then leading to elective cancellations, huge pressure on staff leading to retirement or burnout, and so the capacity gap grows. So it's very clear that one of the things that we need to look for is a commitment to multi-year recurrent funding. Next slide, please. I do want to mention the unscheduled care pressures, which are significant in Northern Ireland, and many of you will have seen the headlines in this regard. We've had a high number of COVID cases throughout the autumn, which have dropped down very recently, but we know they're going to start rising again now with the emergence of Omicron. What we're also seeing is our elective patients becoming urgent, and we have more acutely ill patients as well. The, the measures that we used to have to deal with our on scheduled care pressures, such as popping up additional beds, we're no longer able to do because of trying to prevent nosocomial infection. We have an exhausted workforce, and where we all thought January 21 was probably the most challenging winter that we have ever faced, and indeed it was up to that point, we're now significantly concerned about January 22. Next slide, please. So some of this pressure is coming from bed capacity. So we've made a lot of changes in Northern Ireland since about 2005, 2006, and there's been a significant drop in the number of beds that we have. And a lot of that has been good uh, with the introduction of ambulatory pathways. So for example, emergency ambulatory assessment uh, has been a really good thing within surgery. But we're now at the situation where the capacity or the occupancy in our beds is often well beyond 100%. And I would draw your attention to June 21 on that particular graph, where we can see that there wasn't actually any COVID in Northern Ireland, and yet the occupancy across our hospitals was still beyond 100%. Next slide, please. So if we look at potentially where we could go from this and take it under three levels, regional, trust-based, and in the delivery of training. Next slide, please. When I was a third year medical student, I remember the McKenna report being drafted and the McKenna report is not substantially different than its philosophy from any of the subsequent reviews of services in Northern Ireland. Currently, and you'll hear later from Mark Taylor in much more detail about this, there are many work streams trying to reorganize healthcare in Northern Ireland. But this moves at glacial speed and it certainly will not be happening within the first quarter of 2022. Next slide please. At a trust level, all the trusts are in a state of organisational flux and are often close to being overwhelmed by unscheduled care pressures. Predicted spaces have been established within some acute sites with a green pathway or perhaps the use of green sites in smaller hospitals off the main acute site. If such things are employed properly, it can allow for very rapid flexing of groups of 10 to 20 beds, dealing with unscheduled pressures and also allowing for scheduled care to be turned on rapidly. 
and it prevents the complete shutoff of surgery except in a complete catastrophe. Standard operating policies are well, available, are, are well established in Northern Ireland and other regions for the management of such spaces. Next slide, please. A few things need to be said about the presence of a trainee in theatre, which is relevant to, to the management of theatres. Supervised trainees take on average 16 minutes longer per case than consultants for major abdominal cases. This is quite specific. They need to be specifically supervised, not just left to their own devices. We'll all be familiar with the concept of the ARCP 10.2, extending uh, training by six months at a time. But this, as well as extending training for people who haven't been able to achieve their competencies, prevents consultants' appointments and adds to an unsustainable local bill, which in the UK was £6.2 billion pounds in the year 2019 to 20. If a trust can't train, it will lose its trainees. Training authorities will remove trainees from the trusts, and also trainees will vote with their feet and not go to those institutions to, to um, be registrars. And trusts must preserve surgical activity for their own sake. If they want a consultant body in the future, they must treat the registrars well so that they come back as consultants. Next slide, please. Trainers must plan lists with training in mind, ensure that every trainee contributes something to every case and be prepared to supervise and step back and provide objective feedback on every step of every case. Next slide. Trainees, however, have responsibilities of their own. They must seek out and obtain and use opportunities for training as they arise. Be very flexible in their approach and time, in location of the, the, the hospital in which they're working and in the role they take in theatre. Be happy to delegate roles to other trainees and be absolutely objective in the assessment of their own trainees so that they maximise what they get out of each training opportunity. On a much wider note, it may well be time to look rather more objectively at the impact of the European Working Time Directive and the New Deal for junior hospital doctors in the United Kingdom. Next slide, please. So is there any positive in all of this? I believe there probably is. Next slide. It will inevitably result in rigorous restructuring of training and a proper transition from an apprenticeship to a residency. The development of immersive attachments, particularly in gastrointestinal uh, endoscopy, is well established, where individual registrars can be taken out of training for three months to gain numbers and competencies in um, gastrointestinal endoscopy. The idea of a mini immersive list can now be realised. Because waiting lists are so dreadful, there's no moral imperative to take patients in a strictly chronological order. Therefore, it's possible to create lists which perhaps have 10 anal fistulas, eight hernias, half a dozen gallbladders, so that an individual can receive concentrated training over a day or two in a supervised manner and perhaps speed up the learning curve that they're on. There needs to be a much greater appreciation of the need for an integrated workforce plan between the Department of Health, trainees and training authorities and trusts. And finally, we've already started doing this, but all the untapped training resource within the independent sector needs to be realised. It's not that difficult to get independent sector sites recognised as training sites, and all of them must obtain this recognition. Next slide, please. So I hope we've been able to give you an overview of the, the obstacles and challenges uh, in terms of the lack of recurrent funding the recruitment and the retention challenges that we have and the lack of reform. But those very obstacles also point the way to the opportunities uh, that we can make of that. And I look forward now to handing over to Mark Taylor uh, in terms of the positives ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer, Aidan, and a good evening, uh, President O'Connell and uh, friends. I'm delighted to be here tonight. Um, my first fellowship was with the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, and I very much believe we're better together than apart. So we'll go to um, the slides, please. And we'll go to the next slide. Thanks, Catherine. 
So you've just heard a perfect um, storm created by Jennifer and Aidan, uh, and many will be familiar with the Titanic. Um, clearly the Titanic sunk on its maiden voyage, and many could say that the NHS, as we know it here in Northern Ireland, has sunk, and many people are looking for the life raft. I should also point out the Titanic was fine when it left Belfast. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Jennifer has highlighted some of the reviews that have happened in Northern Ireland, and there's been many reviews in Northern Ireland. Somebody once said that with every review, we inched closer towards the transformed health and social care service. But the current Health and Wellbeing 2026 document is still the live document that we are currently looking at in terms of transforming health and social care in Northern Ireland. Next slide, please. Uh, and it came really on the back of uh, a panel um, that I had the honour of sitting on with Professor Rafael Bengoa uh, to look at how we actually bring about a sustainable health and social care service fit for the future with all of the burning platform that you have heard so eloquently from the previous speakers this evening. And, and with that, we produced a document called Systems Not Structures. There was a clue in the title because we were fixated with structures in Northern Ireland and not actually systems of delivering the best possible health and social care. Next slide, please. It's very much based upon a completely different shift of emphasis from the acute hospitals being the reactive centers of care to basically a system based on looking after patients with chronic conditions, being more proactive in prevention and risk stratification, to be looking at breaking down silos, um, the, sorry, yeah, to be breaking down silos, and really to be looking at outcomes based on value rather than activity. And finally, bringing silo leadership to that of a systemic leadership with interest of all 1.8 million people in Northern Ireland, irrespective of where they live. Next slide, please. And with that in mind, in terms of enabling transformation, it was very much aware that we needed leadership, we needed a workforce, we needed quality and quality in terms of the triple aim at the, at the core of everything that we did. Obviously, the role of e-health, isn't it amazing in the last two years um, how we have relied so heavily on IT and as well as that partnership working. Now, all was very well in that plan until we hit a three-year political hiatus in Northern Ireland. Uh, and following that, when we were dusting ourselves down with a new minister, uh, along came COVID. And as I said tonight, we're apprehensive for Omicron and what is happening uh, uh, for us over the winter. Um, but is nonetheless um, uh, aware that we have that in situ, but what we need to do is move beyond that. Next slide, please. In terms of the overall strategy for the way forward, um, there were priorities and actions that you can see in front of you with a governance structure that Jennifer has mentioned. And that was initially the Transformation Implementation Group, which is now uh, uh, during the COVID pandemic, the Rebuild Management Group, really tasked with looking at multiple areas um, of the change co-production with patients at the very heart of it. Um, but in terms of the surgical fraternity, looking at elective care centres, everyone on this call will know that the separation of scheduled elective surgery from unscheduled practice makes sense. Everyone on this call will be aware that every winter we struggle with capacity. A bed is a bed is a bed. The elective case always falls. And as Aidan has shown you during the last two years, there's been significant reduction in elective and time critical surgery. Next slide, please. COVID-19 came along and I would suggest to everyone tonight that apart from the harrowing situation that we've all found ourselves in, that there now is an opportunity an opportunity that we would maybe not have anticipated prior to COVID, an opportunity where hearts and minds have changed, where IT has led to a radical change in the way we do business, and where really the concept of travel has become accepted because patients are only too willing to travel to get the right care in the right place, performed hopefully by the right person. Next slide. 
And with that in mind, um, it is important not to panic. Next slide. One of the issues that I think this pandemic has highlighted is some people make things happen and some watch that thing happening and others actually really haven't realized anything has happened. Um, and I think the importance for us all is to really start making things happen in terms of Northern Ireland. So let's dive into that in a little bit more uh, detail. Next slide, please. I think events like this are really important and I applaud President O'Connell and certainly our Northern Ireland College Board uh, is a board representative of all four colleges in Northern Ireland where we have had regular engagements with all um, uh, stakeholders within the province and particularly the Minister for Health on a six weekly basis. Uh, and with that regular engagement, next slide, um, we produced a, a, a 10 steps, not 10 year action plan. And that came on the back of the minister suggesting it was going to take at least 10 years to deal with the backlog and waiting lists that Jennifer and Aidan articulated. We felt that it was really important. There was an increased recurrent investment and we're delighted that the budget just announced is actually saying that there is a three year recurrent budget for the first time potential for a budget to be recurring there is a three-year opportunity to plan, but all money in the world will not fix our problem in Northern Ireland if we do not transform and reconfigure our services as well. We talked about protected surgical beds and the need for COVID light sites. Surgical hubs, high activities of protected um, surgical care, free from the COVID situation as far as possible. Uh, and a look at the expansion of the wider surgical workforce, which unfortunately uh, over the last two years has had a major um, uh, effect with nursing staff leaving, retiring, going off on long term. With that in mind, looking at the well being of staff, looking at accountability for how we carry out our day to day business, Aidan has spent quite some time looking at the surgery training. No training today, no surgeons tomorrow. And to change our data in Northern Ireland to be similar to other parts of the United Kingdom in terms of referral to treatment rather than the current situation, which is referral to first outpatient appointment and first outpatient appointment to definitive treatment. And really, the patients that are currently on waiting lists up to four or five years, we need to make sure that we're supporting them to get well on those waiting lists. Next slide, please. The minister um, announced a restart recovery and redesign elective care framework. And what he said at that time was the time for talk long over. What we need now is concerted action. Now remember, this is an elective care framework that was produced during a pandemic with a depleted workforce. But the minister was determined now is the time for concerted action. Next slide. And then that came the concept of the multi-year funding to address the backlog. So we have two major issues. One is the backlog of people waiting, and the current and the second issue is the lack of or not enough capacity to deal with the demand coming in on a daily basis. And within that, he suggested a large sum of money would be needed uh, in additional investment to er eradicate those waiting lists. Next slide, please. He was quite bold in this plan because he put not only targets, but a timeline. And within that timeline, he wanted um, various activities to have taken place by various time frames. Next slide. One of those was music to our ears for the implementation of green pathways. And I will show you an example of that um, shortly, but really to ex expand the elective care center model with surgeries in ring fenced specialist hubs as far as possible. In other words, those hubs would be protected. The staff wouldn't be deployed elsewhere, that the bed wouldn't be used for that unscheduled attendance sitting for three days in an ED department, but that those beds, that staff, and that facility would be protected as far as possible, and that we would take away a post lottery. And sadly, still in Northern Ireland, we have a postcode lottery. Uh, depending on where you live will depend on the access to care and the quality of that care. To look outside the box and think about delivery of mega clinics for outpatients, not just the standard way we did business before, but actually looking at mega clinics, one stop clinics 
bringing in large numbers of patients at weekends uh, to be seen, to be to have diagnostics and to be managed, but also to improve the data, the reporting and the accountability that unfortunately sometimes is like a smoking mirror example. Next slide. Look at performance management and the setting up of a regional prioritization group, which I do want to come back to uh, in, in a second. But ongoing cooperation with the independent sector. The independent sector is not the answer for the long term, but certainly in the short term, we need capacity and we need to take that capacity wherever it arrives. And to look at investment in our staff. How do we incentivize our staff to work those extra wins, to come back in after hours? to open up theatres that would normally close at the weekends to become centres of high output activity. Next slide. The establishment of an elective care team has already happened. There's a new elective care lead uh, and the regional prioritisation group has also happened, which is that every week um, the trusts send uh, representatives with their priority to cases. Uh, if you're not familiar, the FSSA classification of priority two cases that are so time dependent need to be uh, prioritized. Each week, that regional group meet to try and ascertain where the capacity is, what the biggest priority demand is, and to take forward uh, those um, situations where the patients are not uh, sitting on a postcode lottery wing in one centre for cancer surgery and in another centre uh, unable to receive that. A clinically led review of general surgery in Northern Ireland. This is something I'm uh, humbled to be um, chair of and to work with a, a large number of colleagues throughout Northern Ireland to look at the way we business in general surgery here in Northern Ireland. And it's fair to say that we have too many centres trying to do too many things in too many places and general surgery, many other aspects of surgical practice has changed. We become more subspecialist. The general surgeon of past is no longer being trained in Northern Ireland and therefore we need to be much more clever about the buildings that we have. But as Jennifer and Aidan and, and, and we have already suggested, sometimes that comes with an awful lot of politics, both big and small. The next slide, please. So there are certain milestones in the review of general surgery and certainly we hope to go out to consultation in June of next year. We've already looked at a stabilization plan for emergency surgery and that is currently with the Minister for deliberation before a public consultation. Next slide. Um, in terms of what we have done, you can see in front of you with the delivering together time frame, even though we had the political hiatus, even though there was uh, the pandemic, there has been a hive of activity that has taken place, building the very infrastructure that is needed for the transformation of our health and social care. Uh, and so many things have happened, yet I sometimes feel that for people on the ground practicing, they don't necessarily appreciate that change, but nonetheless, that change is happening. Next slide, please. In terms of the mega clinics, I just wanted to give you a sample of some of the mega clinics that have happened. And the numbers are small, but they are a start. And the mega clinics have been in orthopedics, cataracts, dental, and dermatology. And 1,700 patients have been seen in these mega clinics, even with the fact that we have social distancing reductions in the number of patients attending outpatient appointments, et cetera. The other important development at this tight moment following the first and second surges is a critical, care, a critical care plan in which distribution of critical care beds throughout Northern Ireland is looked upon now as a region with protection of some of the critical care beds needed for the more complex regional um, operative interventions. So in other words, that the patients who require that type of intervention uh, um, are able to have it. Next slide, please. And in terms of that regional oversight group, you can see the numbers in front of you. In the interest of time, we'll move to the next slide, Catherine. 
So in terms of the regional hubs or lights, one example of that is the regional lag and valley day procedure unit. Uh, and I saw one of the questions earlier today on the webinar um, asking about ambulatory and day case surgery. Well, this is an example of a COVID light site. Next slide, please. Uh, and so the staff within this site uh, are screened. The patients are screened. Uh, no patient with COVID will come into this site. It is an ambulatory site. It literally wants to start at eight in the morning uh, and do a full day of activity, which seems to be a novel experience for most of us nowadays. That used to be the norm. Uh, it doesn't necessarily seem to be the case now. But Lag and Valley is there. Next slide, please. Uh, and what it has achieved so far is about 2,100 of the most urgent patients. Whilst it's an ambulatory center in the uh, midst of this pandemic, it has been used for priority two patients. That's not ideal. That's not the purpose of it, but um, needs must at this present time. But it's done a host of different subspecialist activity in an ambulatory way. Next slide. I suppose the most important thing for all of us is what do the patients feel? And, and for me, the most important comment about Lag and Valley came from this lady, which was, look, I expected this to be cancelled. We know COVID's about, we know everyone's extremely under pressure, but you know what? It was so reassuring to be in a COVID-free environment and I would definitely recommend it to others. Next slide, please. Virtual consultation is something that we've all had to come to terms with and learn about telephone reviews for clinics, validations of our waiting lists. I suspect that's the cusp of what we're going to see as we look towards a new um, Encompass electronic healthcare rec system for Northern Ireland with patient portals, access to their own information and patients taking much responsibility for their own care. Again, coming away from that, um, reactive model to one of the active system. Next slide, please. You can see that our outpatient activity, as Jennifer already highlighted, plummeted in terms of face-to-face. -face. With that deterioration in face-to-face -face outpatient consultation, we have seen a rise in virtual. And we could debate all the benefits and the disadvantages of virtual consultation in general surgery and beyond. Next slide, please. One of the difficulties in my final two slides is our staff and our workforce. And workforce heals have been happening to look towards retired staff, staff who are shielding, staff unable to work in the COVID environment, really trying to find staff come and assist at this time of our greater need. Next slide. The Minister announced several other COVID light sites, one being Musgrave Park, the other being Oma Primary Care and Community Complex. And that, at this present time, we still are having difficulties around workforce and workforce planning to allow such centres to take forward. But the one thing's for sure, and that is COVID will be with us for several years to come. Therefore, we have got to keep pursuing that COVID green site away from the, the COVID and pandemic, away from the unskilled environment we see. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, there are medium term actions that we do to look at rapid diagnostic centres, rapid endoscopy centres. We need to look at a whole new way of funding the health service, of funding um, the commissioning of services. And our board is currently carrying out uh, evaluation of a various um, costing mechanisms and so tariffs. Next slide, please. And into the long term, obviously, the very infrastructure of what we have in Northern Ireland. We have lots of buildings. We have some buildings vulnerable and unable to sustain rotas, unable to sustain quality service, unable to access associated specialties. And so with that, we have to continue our change um, programme. Next slide. This may all seem rather depressing, but I think COVID lends us an opportunity. Lends us an opportunity where we have already experienced change. And we just need to keep that change going forward so that we do have a sustainable health and social care. And we need friends. And our friends south of the border are as important to us as east west. And therefore, I will finish by saying even the darkest night will end and the sun will rise. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I will now ask Trevor to uh, uh, introduce uh, himself and, and then uh, subsequently the other group, please. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Catherine, can I have the slides for Martin's presentation? 
and you can introduce who you are, Trevor, for the group. Yeah, also yes, uh, Trevor Thompson, I'm uh, another urologist. You can never have too many urologists at any gathering, uh, but I'm speaking as the head of the School of Surgery for NIMTA, which is the Northern Ireland Medical and Dental Training Agency, aka the deanery uh, overseeing training in Northern Ireland uh, for dentists and doctors, GPs and hospital specialties. Uh, and I'd like to just to give a few sentences before Martin King, who is a trainee at the beginning of his general surgical training, and then Graham Finlayson, who is a trauma orthopedic trainee at the end of his training, uh, take you through what it is like to be a, a trainee in Northern Ireland during the COVID era. Thankfully, the, the School of Surgery uh, and NIMTA in general entered the COVID era in a pretty healthy state. Uh, certainly in surgery, we were virtually fully recruited and uh, where we did have gaps in our programs, those were filled by LAT appointments, which are centrally appointed, interviewed uh, appointments of high quality people to fill these gaps. And often some of the gaps uh, were for maternity leave or, or PhD leave or were for deliberate spacing out of our national training numbers for workforce planning so that the conveyor belts were delivering trainees as required and not in bunches. Uh, for most of our recruitment, we recruit through the UK national recruitment and selection programs. We do opt out uh, for uh, we opt out for ENT and trauma orthopedics, and we also opt out in core uh, recruitment. And this year, uh, our, our core recruitment to reassure Mr. President, uh, we have had 400 applications for around and about 45 posts. And I think that represents that surgery is becoming a much more sought after specialty uh, and the issues of work life balance and some of the, the problems with fears of litigation, etc. in pursuing a, a surgical career seem to be lessening and surgery is becoming uh, where it should be uh, the, the top of the pile of uh, uh, training specialties, in my view. Uh, now, our trainees, are, as Aidan has said, are embedded into busy surgical firms. Our firms tend to be small. Everything in Northern Ireland tends to be small. And that is a wonderful thing because it makes each unit nimble. It makes it uh, collegiate. Uh, it makes it a very supportive environment for trainees uh, to work in. Uh, like Aidan, I believe that service and training are not mutually exclusive of one another, as may be the opinion of some other training uh, uh, regions within these islands. But I believe the two go uh, together and a busy service post provides the best opportunity for a busy training post. Um, uh, our trainees are diverse, uh, almost 40 percent female and 28 percent coming from ethnic uh, minority groupings. And our trainees have high morale, even this last year's GMC training survey showed that at NIMTA trainees in general at core level were scoring first out of uh, 14 of the 19 checked domains and our higher trainees were scoring first out of 13 of the, the 19 training domains. So compared to other regions, perhaps we have trainees with higher morale. And I think that probably reflects the small units that they, they work within. We use ISCP as our uh, administrative instrument for training. And if I had to pick one weakness in the, our school prior to COVID, it was our general lack of simulation training. Uh, but we're working on that through the COVID era and hopefully we'll be stronger at that beyond. Uh, and then along came COVID. Uh, you can see the, the curve that Aidan has already described to you. Uh, we do have some uh, specialty specific data and region specific data that we've managed to get out of DARG, uh, the, the data analysis uh, for audit and research group from JCST. Um, and uh, we've used that data in our negotiations with government, with uh, Mr. Swan. Uh, we know that in Northern Ireland, vascular surgery seems to be above the curve and doing better than the UK mean. We know that most of our specialties are on the mean and we know that general surgery and trauma orthopedic uh, surgery are below the mean. And the one thing where we are facing a training calamity is in elective orthopedic training. 
which Graham will expand upon in his talk. So I'd like to pass on now to Martin King, uh, ST3 in general surgery and a senior officer in ASSET. So thank you, Martin. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Good evening, everyone. Mr. President, members of council for RCSI, thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you tonight on this important webinar sharing the current state of surgical training and services in Northern Ireland. I am currently an ST3 at the start of my higher surgical training based in the Belfast City Hospital in Upper GI Surgery. However, when COVID first began, I was a CT2 working in trauma and orthopedics in the Western Trust. And to say it has been a challenging and anxious time, both personally and professionally, navigating recruitment over the past few years is an understatement. However, this evening, I speak as a representative of surgical trainees as a whole, um, as the vice president of ASSETS. ASSETS, for those who aren't familiar with it, is an independent professional body and a registered charity that its philosophy is to promote the highest standards in surgical training and advance both the interests of trainees and ultimately patients. And as a pan specialty and pan grade organization for medical students up to ST8 higher surgical trainees, we represent all on our council. If we can just go to the next slide, please. And the next slide, please. So just to show you the focus um, of our membership, so ASSET represents all surgical trainees in the UK and Ireland. Um, it has, its membership has exponentially kind of grown um, throughout COVID. And I think that ref ref reflects kind of the amount of requests and concerns that trainees have raised. ASSET sits on the JCST, and I, I personally sit in the SAC for general surgery. And amongst all other Royal College boards, we kind of escalate issues across all the regions. There are 15 of us in the executive, and then we have regional representatives across the UK and Ireland representing our members. If we can go to the next slide, please. So in relation to North Northern Ireland, what is the current situation? So if you can just go to the next slide, please. So in comparing the U UK to what it is in Northern Ireland, there are approximately six, just, just short of 64,000 doctors in training in the UK. In Northern Ireland, it's approximately 218 surgical trainees from a core up to higher surgical training. And when you look at it, it's quite a small number and we have access to 13 dedicated hospitals for surgical training. Now, I, I'm here speaking and representing all the subspecialties um, for surgery, but as Graham will allude to, there has been a, a gross differentiation across specialties in terms of access and availability to procedures of which will be important for development of skills operatively, but also for career progression. And I think this is important whenever we look at um, things moving forward. If we can go to the next slide, please. But in order to kind of inform opinion and, and share where we go from, ASSET in conjunction with all the subspecialty organisations of which you see here in this slide, undertook a cross-sectional observational study uh, at the start of the pandemic and moving forward to really quantify and qualitatively and quantitatively the impact of COVID. So in a survey of over 800 trainees um, of across all grades and all specialties, we wanted to look at number one, the overall impact on training, teaching, education, redeployment, and importantly, health and well-being. And I know a few speakers before me tonight, tonight have touched on that important aspect of well-being. But if we can just go to the next slide as well, please. In, in the survey, these are just some of the, the headline statistics, and I'll share with you some more. Effectively, as anticipated, the biggest real um, figure from this is that almost 70% of trainees at the time of the survey in 2020 had 70% complete loss of elective operating. And more so for other subspecialties, access to outpatient and endoscopy training had a similar impact. Now, at that time, 41% of the trainees in the survey were redeployed and worryingly 82% of them was done so on an involuntary basis and 20% of the people that had been redeployed was for more than eight weeks. 80% of all of the people at that time had told us that they had complete course cancellations and, and more so worryingly examination cancellations. On the right hand side of my slide, I want to focus on a second survey that focused on the independent sector. Effectively, with some of the worst waiting times in Europe for Northern Ireland, 
with the loss of um, operations for patients, effectively it's missed opportunity for patients, for, for, for surgical trainees. And unfortunately, with move, movement of potential some NHS listed in dependent sector across the UK, we wanted to understand what the current access for training was in the independent sector. And over 60% of people at that time reported no access. And I'm pleased and grateful for the work of NIMDIDA and the Royal College of Surgeons of England, Northern Ireland Board, in ensuring that trainees um, are, are at the table in terms of ensuring that we um, are working towards having access set up for when um, independent sector activity um, is available. Now, my final statistic on this, and potentially something in terms of workforce planning for the future is more, is more so worrisome. About one in eight trainees as of March 2021 uh, were on an outcome um, that was meaning that they're going to have an extension to their surgical training. And over 25% of trainees in their final year were not on track to CCT on time. Effectively, what that means is that potentially within Northern Ireland and across the UK and Ireland as a whole is that we face a, a shortage in skills that is necessary to help with the workload and failure to uptake consultant posts as anticipated. And if I, if I can touch more so on more live statistics, as of today, the GMC have released the State of Medical Education and Practice Survey and approximately 7% of doctors in training are making current inquiries or applying to change their career. And aside from this being only surgical specific, um, the GMC survey says that 80% of them are citing the impact of their work and, and well-being as a factor. And I think really that statistic for us as an organization and for us leaving here tonight is something that we should take very seriously and important is that we must keep the current trainees that we have in the system in the system, but also work to promote um, surgery as a future career. If we can also go to the next slide, please. So examinations. Throughout COVID, due to um, changes of, of how we provide examinations, there has been um, um, delays, but also cancellations. And from reports that we've had, this has had a detrimental impact on the wellbeing, particularly for those at, at core level looking to complete their MRCS examination. Unfortunately, the next examination for that in January has been postponed, and it's likely that's going to have an impact on over 100 core surgical trainees across the UK and for core trainees within Northern Ireland. However, um, through um, derogations on ARCPs, um, for trainees who do have their MRCS Part A and have either planned uh, um, to or, and or um, have had a MRCS Part B cancelled, there is going to be accepted progression to ST3 with the knowledge that they should complete MRCS Part B by the end of ST4. But without this being um, all, all negative, I'm going to move on to my next slide. What are the potential solutions? First and foremost, uh, next slide. As people have said um, earlier in tonight's call, this is everyone's problem and everyone needs to be part of the solution. The JCST in relation with BOTA and the Confederation of Postgraduate Surgical Schools and ASSET produced the um, paper that Mr Armstrong shared earlier in his presentation in relation to the state of logbooks across the UK and Ireland. And effectively, in consideration with the WHO surgical checklist, what we've called for is at the start of every single list no matter where that may be or what that list may be, is that there should be an educational brief to understand what are the aspects of a procedure that a surgical trainee may be involved in. And I think it's important then to have that live feedback that the trainee can get benefit despite the challenges that we currently face. And this checklist here, as you can see on the graph, is widely available on the JCST website. Next slide, please. One thing that I would like to kind of share with you is an innovation and improvement strategy that I think really is really fitting for even the fact that we're having tonight's conversation. And this is the asset innovation strategy, which is the three A's of awareness, agreement and access. And the first aspect of that tonight is awareness. I think we've all quite clearly identified the problems and we've raised our concerns about the challenges and the unmet needs. But I think we need to really move now towards agreement of what we can provide and how we can provide access to that for trainees moving forward. And I'm pleased to have all of these key stakeholders here represented tonight. Next slide, please. Training has been a key focus on some of the biggest reports this year. Mr Taylor has alluded to the Northern Ireland Action Plan from the uh, English College Northern Irish Board on 10 steps, not 10 years. 
and training is, is a reference within that as one of the action plans. With the establishment potentially of green pathways and COVID light sites, what we really call for is agility and flexibility in workforce planning to allow surgical trainees from all specialties to avail of the opportunities that will rightfully come from those um, opportunities for patients. Minister Schwann in June, um, following um, the publication of the um, action plan, referenced surgical training and has made a commitment to work with um, the college um, to identify actions that it can mitigate the impact that we've currently referenced earlier this evening. Next slide, please. I'm going to finish off before Graham alludes to the specific um, issues in this one specialty for Northern Ireland, which really highlights the, the, the devastating problems that I've kind of shared with you. Time has been taken away. We've almost had over two years now of the current issues being highlighted, and we've had um, a plan of how we can kind of mitigate that for. But I, what I would ask for and call for is action. And I would also like to ask for the support of, 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 of the college in helping trainees across Northern Ireland accessing the resources. Surgical training uh, to looking towards the future is going to require the use of technology and simulation, as Mr. Thompson has alluded to. And I think if we work more collaboratively and closely, then we can really see a true improvement in surgical training. Thank you. Thank you very much for speaking so clearly on behalf of trainees, Martin. My name is Graham Finlayson. I'm an ST8 in trauma and orthopaedics, and I currently work in the Belfast Trust. Thank you, firstly, to the college for the invitation to speak tonight. It's a pleasure to, and a privilege to be allowed to join you all. Um, I'm speaking as a representative of the British Orthopaedic Trainees Association, for whom I'm the SAC rep, and I was previously for a long period of time, the Northern Irish representative as well. Uh, so I'm well aware of the challenges facing the region. The next slide, please. The curriculum in trauma and orthopaedic surgery requires a balance of elective and trauma activity, as you would expect. We've seen from a previous slide that elective reconstructive orthopaedic surgery uh, has one of the greatest benefits to quality of life to patients of any surgical intervention. I'm going to talk very specifically about the problems affecting the Belfast Trust. And the reason for that is that previously, prior to the pandemic, the Belfast Trust accounted for 70% of Northern Ireland's elective orthopaedic activity. At present, elective orthopaedic activity in the Belfast Trust over the last three months has averaged 5% of the pre-COVID level. Even that doesn't reflect the full picture. This week, la last week, of 19 surgical sessions, where one session equaled a half-day list of operating in Musgrave Park Hospital, 12 were allocated to trauma. So we're already doing the spillover from our major trauma centres, and we're losing more elective cases as a result. Usually, we would expect 70 to 80 sessions of elective surgery in Musgrave Park per week. Next slide, please. This slide is absolutely crucial. It shows you that at the period where prior to the pandemic, trainees were being exposed to approximately 170 operations on average during a six month rotation and they were the primary surgeon in 69% of those cases. That's the two bars on the left hand side of the graph. There was an immediate dip when the orthopaedic trainees were redeployed vol voluntarily to work in ICU during the first wave of the pandemic. And there was a positive recovery for a period of time. Unfortunately, there has been a huge nursing redeployment from Musgrave Park Hospital to elsewhere within the trust and there has been an enormous problem with loss of nursing staff to other uh, areas such as the independent sector or to retirement and the most crucial thing in this slide is that it shows that based on current logbook numbers trainees are projected in this six month rotation we're currently in to achieve on average exposure to 125 operations of which only 52 percent of those cases they will be the primary operator in and again it's really crucial to stress that this is all trainee operating numbers so that includes trauma 
Um, and it doesn't reflect the full picture of how badly elective surgery has been just decimated by this in, in Northern Ireland. The next slide, please. So there's 15 of the 31 trauma and orthopedic trainees in Northern Ireland are in the last two years or now 18 months of their training. And it is a huge challenge for them, and that includes me, to achieve the indicative numbers that's required in elective surgery to exit the training programme. Trainees at my stage, and I include myself in this statement, feel poorly prepared for elective practice as consultants because we have not had the necessary exposure. There is an enormous risk of delays to training progression, as Martin has clearly articulated already. But the worst case scenario is that if this doesn't improve, the training scheme is not sustainable. You cannot train orthopaedic surgeons if you cannot provide them with elective training orthopaedic uh, uh, opportunities. And if the, the orthopaedic training programme fails, the trauma network in Northern Ireland, which relies on trainees for service provision, and in particular for out of our on-call commitments, will collapse. And even at a consultant level, rotas are short staffed across the province. And it's I cannot stress enough that although I sound like I may be playing this up, this is not hyperbole. The trainees as a group and our training programme director individually have written to the Minister for Health to express these concerns. This is a major issue and it will come to a head within the next six months if we don't do something about it. Next slide, please. So what are the barriers to change? Because I think this is important. There has been a decision to ration elective orthopaedic care so that staff can really be redeployed elsewhere. And I think there's a lack of accountability for that. Nursing staffing retention and recruitment is appalling in the Belfast Trust, particularly within orthopaedics. And currently there are approximately 14 out of a previous cohort of 100 specialist orthopaedic theatre and recovery personnel still remaining in Musgrave Park. As I've already said, nurses have left for other units, for the private sector, for retirement or due to sick leave. And I've been told by management within the trust that every nurse who has left Musgrave Park for other sectors or for retirement was redeployed. And that was not on a voluntary basis. Unfortunately, access to training in the private sector has not materialised, and that's because if you're going to train someone in the private sector, you need to be able to pay the private sector for any decrease in the total volume of work they might be doing. And uh, at present, there's no waiting list initiative orthopaedic activity going on within the private sector. Next slide, please. So are there any roads to recovery or areas to be positive on? The first thing is that this requires a desire to change from the executive leadership. And the first step to that has got to be nursing retention and recruitment, and that's got to be essential. It has to be ring fenced from redeployment because it's clear that that's a driver in forcing nurses to leave the trust. Training within the private sector is undoubtedly going to be one of the avenues we must pursue. But as I've alluded to, this will cost the trust's money. If a consultant can do six hip replacements on a list, but I can only do four, the private sector is losing 50% of their profits from that day of operating and someone has to make up that shortfall and that will cost the trust money. The other thing that we've also heard discussed is the idea of trainee redeployment, either on short term kind of mini domestic fellowships, either within the UK or down to the south of Ireland as well, for further elective experience in areas where we are deficient. And Hopefully, hopefully the fact that we're able to talk about these things within these forums allows us to have this opportunity to drive change forward, because if it doesn't happen, elective orthopaedics in Northern Ireland will cease to exist. And I really can't stress enough that I don't believe that to be a hyperbolic statement. Thank you again for the opportunity to talk to you all this evening. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas, uh, do you want me to st start on the questions? Yes, yes Gaiman, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, the first question I see there is from Professor Kevin Barry from Galway. Uh, Kevin is the national, or is the director of the National Surgical Training Programmes in Ireland. 
The college has a unique position in that unlike the other surgical colleges, it is responsible for the surgical training and the delivery of it. So um, his question is, um, how are you coping with the new curriculum project and the new multiple consultant report and assessment, which uh, capabilities and practice? Probably this one's for you, Trevor, do you think? Yes, uh, we have uh, rolled out the education uh, videos and tutorials for the new curriculum to include the Ask Keith program. Uh, our AESs are briefed and our TPDs are briefed, but I'll be able to answer the question probably uh, at the beginning of February after we do our interim ARCPs. So we do an ARCP uh, twice yearly, um, a reasonably informal one at half time and then a formal one at the end of the training year. So I suspect uh, the laboratory of uh, activity for uh, the new curriculum and multi-consultant multi uh, reporting and SIPs and the rest of it, I will be able to tell you in February. Right, uh, Ronan. Well, thank you. Can I just come in at this stage and say how thankful we are for the amount of preparation that everybody has put into this really very informative uh, webinar that is informative certainly to those of us south of the border who uh, are not as familiar uh, with the Northern Ireland uh, system and the uh, and the arrangements that you make. Uh, and I'm sure those who have tuned in from Northern Ireland also it's very it's very helpful for them uh, for them to appreciate uh, the amount of work that's going on by uh, Jennifer and um, Aidan and Mark and, and Trevor and the trainees, everybody is aware and focused uh, about the difficulties. And I have to say, we share many of the difficulties that you have, uh, non-recurrent funding, political change, uh, and this, you may be familiar with the Slauncher Care project, which is uh, uh, running into difficulties and again it's trying to organize and integrate care within the community uh, and to uh, ensure uh, that the hospitals are not the uh, the center point but it is the community uh, and hospitals are a required service within the community uh, but this may be a long project but but we are going along the same lines i i have to say though the the last two presentations were really sobering and, and I think, Graeme, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is not hyperbole. This is reality. And uh, the ST7s and ST8s uh, getting a 10.2 uh, at the end of it is A, disheartening um, and demotivating, uh, but also uh, very challenging for the health services because uh, the older consultants are burning out and are trying to get out as soon as they can and we have to have younger people coming in. So my question for you all is how can RCSI, or because I chair JSCM, how can the other surgical royal colleges assist you? I know that the English College through Mark and the board in Northern Ireland are doing a great deal. Uh, if there are uh, ways that we can assist this, uh, perhaps we can have, uh, you, you can feed back to us. But thank you all for the uh, commitment and the level of pre uh, preparation that you've put into this webinar. Uh, President, thank you very much, and I agree with you. What a what a great uh, a lineup of speakers we've had this evening, and it is quite sobering to hear the two trainees talking about uh, training and the lack of exposure to cases. Uh, and uh, Graeme, you in particular, I can see that. Uh, you're taking this very seriously, and uh, it's 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 a big deal for the future because you are the future of surgery, the, the trainees in surgery, uh, and the difficulty is is getting these cases. And where where we had a, a meeting during the week about having trainees from the south go up to the north and north down south. Uh, Graham and and Martin, do you think that that would work as as one year of your training? Would trainees in the north accept that they might spend one year in one of the hospitals down south and equally for our trainees in the south to spend a year in the north? Uh, Martin or, or Graham, do you want to? At, at this I, stage, to be totally honest with you, I would go anywhere to do the do any elective operating. 
Um, I know at least one of my colleagues is trying to leave the training scheme early so that he can go to London to do a, a, a short-term fellowship in London, which he hadn't planned but has been applying for. And I think that's reflective of the fact that he's not being given the opportunities to complete his final six months of training in, in the way that the training scheme is designed, which is doing something that is in his area of subspecialty interest and equally my final six months of training are not going to be in my area of subspecialty interest so so really any any opportunity to achieve elective operating from an orthopedic perspective is something that nearly all of my colleagues would be willing to take any avenues to explore martin what what do you feel and then we'll we'll uh go on to mark then after that martin Thank you, Professor Lynch. Um, I can give you a personal example. I'm a newly appointed ST3 to general surgery, of which we've had minimal elective operating. And thankfully, I work you know, in the Belfast Trust New Unit, where the, I have fantastic you know, live feedback from the trainers. But I'm also personally cognizant of skill acquisition and rate of skill acquisition from an operative perspective. And like all the data suggests, um, we're, we're way behind, and I know I'm way behind where I need to be and where I should be. And I think any trainee who's very kind of determined to kind of be the best that they can operatively, but across all domains in surgical training would avail of any opportunity that would present where they could develop as a, as, a, as a trainee. And if that involves going to other units on the island of Ireland, then I think it would be welcomed. And I think it would be welcomed by the deanery, you know, to come back then to Northern Ireland to the post and come back to our units with, 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 with more skills. And I think another aspect to it as well is access to simulation for, for more junior trainees as well would be very highly welcomed. OK, now, Mark, you have a hand up, but I want to ask Jennifer a question and you could be thinking about the answer, Jennifer, while Mark is speaking. But do you feel uh, from the management point of view that it would work that you'd have trainees in Northern Ireland coming to the south or vice versa? There are different jurisdictions, different contracts and everything. And is it something that could be worked out? So just think about that, Jennifer, while Mark is speaking. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, thank you very much. And just really following um, um, Professor O'Connell's comments, I, I think one of the things that I am very grateful for uh, with a College of Surgeons of England hat is the fact uh, that we have the intercollegiate support of four presidents. Um, and also Michael Westside sits on our Northern Ireland board um, for the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland. I think that the sobering presentations from Martin and Graham mean that we've got to look at every opportunity for training uh, and certainly uh, the college's voice in Northern Ireland has been articulating particularly the orthopaedic problem because it's extremely um, uh, alarming to hear what Graham has just said uh, and I suppose that all options need to be looked at. We have seen um, uh, paediatric surgery, how it has really benefited from uh, an all-Ireland agenda. We're certainly looking at the regional metabolic surgery and very much linking in with Dublin and some of the, the work that is happening in the Southwest Acute Hospital with preventive cardio, um, um, cardiology. I think really the answer is it has to be an open door. Now, that's easy for me to say. I'm conscious I was graduate dean and head of school are on this line, and certainly we've got to do something and and actually, we've got to do it very quickly. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, Jennifer, my question, uh, what, what do you think is that any, are there obstacles from the management point of view? I, th I think we absolutely have to explore this and I think there'd be a willingness to look at it. I think we'd have to do that in conjunction with the relevant deaneries uh, because it's the deanery that actually employs uh, the trainees in Northern Ireland. But as Aidan was saying in his presentation earlier, it's that, that, that hugely close link to surgery, so there would have to be reciprocation uh, to make sure that the, the, the level of service is still delivered. But I have to say, I think a lot of us are deeply concerned what we've heard from, from Graham. We clearly have to do something uh, in order to, to ensure that uh, the, the training is completed and that we have surgeons for, for the future. Um, I, I started my career in the former Green Park Trust, which is Musgrave Park Hospitals over 20 years ago, whenever we were putting through vast volumes of orthopaedic surgery. So it, it is really, really concerning to hear this, I must say. I think it is something that we have to explore. Thank you.
Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Professor O'Connell, President, uh, you have your hand up and I'll just speak short up to you and I think we'll draw the meeting to a close then. Well, well I think Graham has wants to come back in first, uh, Tom. I didn't see Graham's hand. Oh. Graham, sorry, I, I missed your hand up there. I don't see it here, my. That's very Did kind of you, Professor. Thank you. Um, you hear my... I, I was really to, to support what Jennifer has said. It's important to remember where we have come from and how, just how good Northern Ireland's elective orthopaedic service was prior to this. When I applied for my registrar number, I was given an offer to have a number in Northern Ireland or a number in Scotland, where I'm originally from. And everybody that I spoke to in Ireland, Scotland, England or Wales, and I spoke to a lot of senior consultants, said stay in Northern Ireland because the standards are higher. And the the fact that that was what happened beforehand we had a, a world leading arthroplasty hospital in musgrave park and now we have a shell uh, the the difference is so stark that it cannot be emphasized enough we, we were the best in the world and we've let that go the aim should be to be the best in the world because we've proved we can do that it's a long-term goal but it shouldn't be out with our grasp a very sobering comment there, Graham. Uh, very sobering. Uh, so uh, I'll hand over now to uh, uh, Professor O'Connor, but I'd just like to say a special thanks again to Trevor Thompson uh, for uh, his significant input into organising tonight's webinar. And uh, even with the drawbacks of an online webinar, it's been very, very interesting. And I think it's hopefully the start of, of more dialogue between uh, North and South, uh, and that's along with the other Royal Colleges also. And thank you also to my co-chair, Eamon Mackle, who's from the North, but uh, a, a fellow uh, member of council. Thank you, Eamon, for that. And to President O'Connell, who actually initiated the Northern Irish, uh, uh, Northern Ireland Committee, and this meeting is as a result of that. So, uh, Ronan, would you like to finish up? Well, well, thank you and, and thank you all again. And thank you, Mark, for your kind words about the, the other Royal Colleges joining uh, with the English College in uh, an intercollegiate approach. I have to say I, I, I am deeply moved by Graham's uh, account. Musgrave Park, uh, I'm a colorectal surgeon and uh, even as a colorectal surgeon who stayed as far away as I could from reamers and nails and 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 uh, sockets, uh, Musgrave Park was one of the world leading uh, institutions. We we really knew how good it was, and it is very sad to see that it has uh, uh, come almost to a halt. And I sincerely hope that this will will be um, amenable to recovery. Just to say that Brexit has had um, an unexpected um, effect in terms of registration between North and South, um, that because uh, the UK has left the European Union, there isn't immediate uh, and automatic recognition of the primary degree. Fellowships and memberships are recognised, uh, but the primary medical degree is not recognised. Uh, and so applying for registration within the European Union, including um, uh, the Republic of Ireland, uh, is equivalent to applying from Pakistan or India or anywhere else outside the European Union. Um, uh, so, so it does add uh, difficulty and this is by virtue of an European uh, Union regulation of 2007. We have made representations uh, to uh, the Ministry for Higher Education uh, and Further Education here and also the Department of Health uh, down here in terms of, of looking at this. We're working uh, with the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges and I've spoken with the uh, with the chair of the Irish Medical Council and the chair of the General Medical Council. In the UK, you have a derogation by ministerial order until the 1st of January of next year of, of 2023, which makes it uh, feasible for Irish graduates to register with the GMC. And I, I would say to Mark and Jennifer, with your influential hats, these are things that uh, they're minor things in the overall scheme, and yet uh, it is something that can oil the wheels. And, and I would certainly uh, try to work on that. 
May I suggest that as we do with um, other regions where we have members and fellows, that maybe we could come back in a cycle in six months and perhaps have uh, a similar discussion. Uh, but I do really want you to know that the college in Dublin is well disposed. And if we can help, because we have extremely good simulation facilities in the college, if there were ways that we can put these at the um, uh, and make them available to Northern Ireland trainees, I'm sure this would be feasible. Uh, and any way we can help, the door is open. And with that, can I thank everybody? I, I thought it was an extraordinarily informative and, as I said, well-prepared uh, presentation that uh, all of us uh, from the South uh, have learned a great deal. And I hope that the discourse amongst yourselves will help come to uh, solutions. So good evening to all. And uh, may I wish you uh, season's greetings, happy Christmas, and above all, uh, a happier new year, a healthier new year. And thank you all. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.